welcome uh, those of you listening live on a very warm evening in June. That's terribly dedicated and we're, we're really, really uh, impressed and, and grateful to you for being here to, to have what we hope will be a conversation, despite the fact this is webinar format. Um, the way we're going to run this is we're going to chat with each other really about some of the issues. We're not going to talk. Um, we are going to draw from the book, but we're not going to start um, mechanistically talking about the book itself. We want to talk much more about um, the history that's in this and how we might actually use and address um, the issues that it throws up in the classroom. And uh, we want to encourage you to put questions into chat and we will probably talk a bit more at the front and I'll make a note of any um, questions and keep, a, keep an eye on things. So apologies that I may be looking slightly at my other screen. Um, but then increasingly, you know, we will be um, just responding really to what you want. And it, it occurred to us as we were talking that you might want to ask us about how we approach some of the issues that are actually quite sensitive and controversial in relation to this history. And we're really up and open for that if you would like to do that. Um, so I hope you're sitting somewhere comfortably. And as I say, please be participative, otherwise it'll just be us wittering to ourselves, although we quite like doing that and we very much enjoyed the, um, the year or so of doing this book as a result. Um, so my name, as you can see, is Helen Snelson and my main role is leading the uh, history teacher training course at the University of York. I'll hand over to Ruth. Hello, everybody. Uh, lovely to see you all here tonight. My name is Ruth Lingard. I work with Helen actually one day a week on the University PDC course uh, with her historians, but I'm also every day a history teacher in a secondary school in York as well. I'll hand over to Claire. Hi everyone, um, so my, I'm Claire Hollis and I'm currently the Head of History at Rygate College, which is a state sick form uh, down in Surrey. Um, so that's pretty much my day job uh, and it's been uh, in addition to obviously being part of this team as well. Um, so I'll just hand over to Susanna. Thank you. Um, my internet connection is terrible, so tell me if I need them at any point. Um, my name is Susanna Boyd and I work in a school in Leicester and I'm also a curriculum lead for a big multi-academy trust. Thank you, Susanna. We are, the, the rural, rural, rurality is uh, affecting us, so I think we probably will go with the plan if it's all right. Susanna's going to turn off her camera. It doesn't mean she's gone for a gin. It means that she's still very much there, but we've discovered that actually if she loses the camera, then the um, internet hopefully is much, much stronger, so uh, we may go down that route. Um, we've put things down into uh, sort of three big questions, really, to start off with, to, to kick about. And our first one is uh, around what is the thinking behind this new approach to teaching British social history at Key Stage 3? And um, we've particularly taken a focus of about 1920 to about 2000. And I just want to introduce that uh the thinking behind that, if you like, the big picture behind that to start off with, which is that we've decided to take a look at British social history through the lenses, if you like, particularly of three types of social history and three groups who are studied by social historians. So in no particular order, but the history of disability um, and, of course, disability, disablement, impairment, and lack of access to society, disability being disabled by society is a vast, vast area which covers then many smaller groups um, and we've tried to touch into some of that and, and some of those uh, particular histories. And also the history of Gypsy, Roma and Traveller people and again that is a massive portmanteau term and I won't unpick it for now but we can potentially go that way if you would like to, you can ask questions in, in chat as to what we mean when we talk about Gypsy Roma Traveller, but Gypsy Roma Traveller history is um, less well developed as a historiography um, than others, uh, but nevertheless there is a historical academic discipline um, that we can draw upon, historical scholarship, and uh, so that's been one of our other lenses. And then um, the social history bunch of queer history, so LGBTQ+, histories um, and looking at, um, again, stories and themes from, from across this whole period in relation to that. 
But at the same time, um, we've tried to, having decided, okay, this is a social history that's about all sorts of people, if you like, we let rip a bit. And as we've gone along, we've tried to keep a, a tally on ourselves in terms of the number of people named in our book. I think we've done it. It shouldn't be so hard with a um, social history of Britain in the 20th century to get 50% named women. But it really was surprisingly difficult at times, which is quite an interesting process. Um, but the people in our book, and there are a lot of people that feature in our book, are all sorts of people, um, different genders. Um, we have got black people, brown people, white people. We've also kept a real tally of where people were from. So we've made a big effort to try and cover the whole of the United Kingdom and um, places that maybe don't necessarily feature in textbooks. So there was definitely a geographical element to, to what we were doing. So that's a bit of an introduction to the sort of substantive way we've gone about social history. And, and yes, of course, we've looked at the major events and happenings that impacted people living in Britain. But we, as we were thinking, we were like teasing about what we were going to use as our, if you like, disciplinary underpinning. And we came up with, um, after much discussion, that we wanted to focus on consequences, on impact, on how things worked out for people. Um, some of those consequences were unintended, some of them were intended. And then there was the issue as well about how, of course, did people respond? Um, how were they able to respond to things that were happening around them? So we very much take an approach of saying, okay, there are these big events and changes and happening. Now let's get in and, and have a look at what was actually going on. So we're just going to tell you a little bit about the story, some of the business. Yeah, thanks, Helen. So uh, we are, were thinking about these really rich stories as we were researching. We were coming across these really rich stories. And I think as history teachers, one of the things you find is that say you're talking about the consequences of the First World War, you might just have a kind of byline that you say, oh yeah, and lots of women got the vote and some of their lives changed. But as historians, we really felt like we didn't really have much evidence for that. And certainly as history teachers, we didn't have at our fingertips those rich stories to, to show our students what we actually meant by that. So I'm going to share with you some of these complex stories and I want you to think about how you could use them perhaps in the classroom um, because they are fantastic stories so we've got for example if, we're, if you're imagine you are teaching the consequences of the first world war and I think often we teach the consequences of the first world war as a very kind of literal list of casualties uh, how many died and then probably we don't do very much else with it Let's just take these stories and I'm, I'm, I'm just going to get you to think in your, in your heads, what, what consequences can you draw out from these stories? So the first story we've got is a great story of a woman called Margaret Partridge. Now, she ended up during the war um, making X-ray machines. She designed electric engines during the war. And then when the war ended, obviously her job was taken over again by a man. Um, but she didn't let that stop her. This was a career that she really wanted. She was an engineer. She is interestingly coming from quite a, a well-off background. She goes to a grammar school, um, so she does have some privilege, but she's down in Devon. You know, it's not the hot spot of kind of engineering going on at the moment. Well, sorry, Devon, I did used to live there. That's not, um, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not slamming them, but I know where she was and it was quite rural. So uh, she is, uh, she's, she's working really hard. And what she's doing is she decides um, she is going to carry on her work as an engineer. She wants to do this. And so she works setting up her own electrical engineering business. And she is very good at working out labour saving devices for women um, and selling those as things that are going to make their life easier. She sees that in the way that perhaps men often don't. So she sees a market there for that. And she becomes the first woman to wire an entire English village for electric light, which is fantastic. So she it's a kind of one of those positive stories <laughs> that perhaps we don't tell very often. But the idea that the unexpected consequences that are coming out in the First World War are not just 
women sort of having to doing some work in the First World War and then coming out of that again, but opportunity and some of these women really um, pioneering that work in engineering, which I don't think, again, we mention very much that women, a few of them, were doing this work. And although, you know, she, they, they met some obstacles because actually it was difficult for, for women to work because the, tra- the, the union laws, it was the trade union laws, but it was certainly the, the laws that were in place at the time had some limits on, on women working, uh, actually doing work um, as after hours, sort of late in, at night and things. That was very old legislation that had to be overturned as well. So there's all sorts of things going on with her. So she's fab. And we could also take, along with Margaret, we could compare her story with another similar story of Annette Ashby, also an engineer during the war, also gave up her job at the end of the war, but she builds her own company. She builds her own, you know, building factory, basically, so she can manufacture tools and appliances, sets up her own company uh, in the area of Loughborough. So again, in the Midlands, we're not getting a story down in the, in the south, in the, or, you know, maybe attached to Cambridge or Oxford, but we're getting a story of women really kind of doing all sorts of exciting things. Now, both of those are not uh, perhaps working class women, but we could take someone like Laura Wilson. In 1925, she starts building houses. She sets up her company doing that and she builds 242 houses. So what we can reveal about this perhaps is the impact of the war for some women was not completely negative, but there were opportunities here and that women were bringing perhaps a new opportunity in terms of being able to market or spot a market uh, for that 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 women would want perhaps electric lights they would want labor saving devices they might want an electric washing machine which would save women you know days of work uh, could be done in a few hours and Laura Wilson as well, designing houses, she's very much from a working class background, but designing houses for working class people. And uh, this, this idea that women have never done this stuff before is being challenged, perhaps overturned with these slightly more complex, interesting, thought provoking stories. Mm-hmm. Right, I'll, uh, I'll hand back over. As well as Claire, you were going to say something yep. about themes, I think, at this point, weren't you, as you were teaching yeah. up there? Yeah, definitely. I mean, so obviously in terms of the book, we're covering lots and lots of different stories here. And when we were putting it together, we were really conscious that, you know, we weren't expecting people to just use the entire book as it stood. Um, So we wanted to really make sure that there were certain kind of really rich, brilliant stories that could be picked out and used. Also some kind of key themes that would fit in with what it was that people wanted to try and get at with their students, what sort of things they wanted to talk about in terms of people's experience of the 20th century in Britain. Um, So some of the kind of key themes, well, obviously one of the biggest themes is something that Helen Ruth were talking about earlier on is the consequences of big events. So the consequence of World War I, for example, but also Later on in the book, we look at some of the consequences of World War II, the establishment of the welfare state and how that actually plays out into people's lives. Um, And then also the impacts of things like global civil rights movements, local civil rights movements, how people interact with them, how they choose to participate in them. and, and how the sort of uh, people's experience of these kind of um, big seismic events are quite different um, across the board. Um, so that's one kind of big theme. Um, and that could be a way of sort of looking at it in the classroom um, when you're looking at a big event, then exploring, OK, well, how do the consequences of these events play out? Um, other big themes that we were sort of kind of threading through the book were firstly, the, uh, the communities themselves and how they organise. So um, looking at sort of like you know movements um so um for example um you've got um uh, p- uh, movements um of disabled people in the 1930s campaigning for justice not charity um the kind of women's social and professional organizations being set up in the 1920s and 30s um the establishment of councils and international congresses for gypsy roma and traveler people um and the development of gay and, um, gay and trans rights movements in the 70s and 80s um so 
across the board, there are lots of these different kind of community organizations and explore. Uh, and one of the threads that you can pick up in the book is how people form these organizations, how and why they do that, how people interact within them, who is included, who is sometimes left out um, of those organizations as well. And then related, there's another sort of theme, which is the interaction between communities and the state um, there. Um, so I'll just talk about two different inquiries which kind of deal with that. Um, so there's one where we look at um, the um, sort of kind of post-war era where we talk about how how it was was it hard to be different in Britain in the post-war years and that kind of looked at the experience of sort of disabled people but also of specifically gay men um, in the aftermath um, of um, World War II, the establishment of this kind of post-war settlement, but also how that settlement can be quite exclusive um, and showing how all these changes in social organisation and, and how the government interacts with the population, how that actually played out for people in these communities. Uh, and then you know, similar, similarly going back earlier on, looking at sort of um, an, an inquiry about how women organised for change, uh, sorry, later on, how women organised for change at the end of the 20th century. So looking at kind of like, you know, um, how women um, kind of campaigned uh, and worked together to try and achieve um, changes uh, later on uh, in the 20th century there as well. So essentially, it's sort of that's that's another thing, threads you can pick up. How does the state and how does government action uh, have an effect or an impact on communities themselves as well? Yeah. Mm. There's a question actually in the chat already, which we can um, we'll pick up as it goes through. In terms of um, miners' wives, that we, we have addressed the miners' strike, but actually, and, and Claire, will, Claire will come on to this more later. We've done it through um, lesbian and gay support the miners. We've done it through that way, so we so we touch on it, but it's but it's more a focus on that, which will which we'll perhaps come back to. So so thank you for for asking that one. Um, yeah, I could talk about that. I mean, later on, we'll talk about the inquiry of that period, so I can touch on that in a bit more yeah, detail. That would well. be that be brilliant. Thanks, Claire. And, as we were as we were talking about um, you know, what to put in the book, this obviously is so, it's such a diffuse how you find a way through. We realised that we we were having lots of conversations about um, silences and archives, etc. So Susanna, I know you're going to sort of take us through a little bit of that sort of thinking about the idea of, of the making history section of the book. Lovely, thank you. I'm just going to put my camera on for a moment so people can see what it looks like, and then I'll turn it off again. No camera. <laughs> no camera. I have built it. I'm sorry. Let's see. Right. Well, anyway. <laughs> oh my. If well, hopefully. Can you still hear me? Or is it too yeah, awful? Yeah. Marvelous. Okay. So um we were very much talking about um, as uh, Helen said, what all say because we were very keen to make sure that we different narratives so that we shared the diverse experience of Britain in the 20th century but we were also very conscious that as um, you know, teachers of history we very much want to have the an understanding of the historic process and so we were very lucky to have a number of historians, archivists, actors who were very happy to um, talk to us about their own sort of research processes and the sources um, that are available to them. So in front of me, I'm really sorry, you can't see it but, you know, as well, um, is a lovely section um, about uh, sort of how can we know about people when there are no records of them? Because certainly when you're trying to challenge narratives, when you're trying to talk about diverse histories that maybe people are familiar with um, it's really helpful to go well how do we know this what is evidence base and so we've got a section here about um how we can use quantitative and qualitative data um, and you know the traces of some people in the past is just quantitative they are just numbers on sheets in census or tax um returns and so on and so we've got a very nice section um in the making history on well how can you draw out the stories um of individual people um we've also got things like how can you use um case studies and case histories of maybe one particular person and draw from that um that micro history into the sort of bigger 
um, as well. So I think you know these are this sits really well with the other part of the content. But you can use it to students to investigate um, a little more and actually talk about the historic process rather than it just being that you as teachers or educators give them knowledge, they absorb it, they then regurgitate it on the test. It's a far more um, sort of mean making as a sort of community of learners rather than just being um, them as pupils, we as teachers as well. I'll mm. pass back to Helen. Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? We were, we were thinking about some of those um, things that Trula identifies, and we, we had a lot of help from uh, the National Archives on this. So they've, they've helped us write spreads on things about why things never even get recorded in the first place. So we can make all that sort of thing clear. Just Clara, just, just thinking about that, you did something on, something came out of your thinking as well, didn't it, in terms of describing and how we describe people? Just yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, one of the things we were, were looking at was sort of, um, cause, I mean, I was kind of coming at this with a lens of looking at sort of um, LGBTQ or queer history and um, and the difficulty, obviously, of the kind of the, the sort of terms that we use today um, uh, are, were very much the product of, well, the later 20th century, they didn't really become widespread uh, and used widely until then. Uh, and so, obviously, the problems of how you talk about people um, who may describe themselves slightly differently um and so we yeah we've we managed to we put a, um a, some sections in that make history where we kind of open up that question for students because i think it's a, a really interesting question across the board isn't it really we all sort of like you know use kind of like terms that have been sort of invented by historians to kind of describe people in the past um and it's and often we kind of don't always interrogate kind of know the uh, why we do that and the impact that might have that can have and so it's quite nice to actually directly engage with that question mm. so i've learned so much about uh, 20th century history from sort of listening to you talk over the last year or so claire it's absolutely been fantastic well, likewise <laughs> how, how do you think differently now about british social history in the 20th century than you did before yeah, I mean, I think obviously, I mean, I, one of the brilliant experiences of writing this book is uh, is kind of you come with your own kind of area of sort of like of knowledge, and then kind of trying to work with everyone else who has their own sort of areas of expertise and sort of weave it all together. It's just been amazing in general. Um, I think the thing that I found really that sort of struck me is um, over and over again is there's a tendency sometimes to look at the 20th century as a sort of age of progress in a very sort of like, you know, a, you know, unproblematic way that, you know, this is a sort of era in which, you know, people across the board are living a lot more kind of constrained um, lives at the start, and then things gradually get better uh, until we sort of reach where we are now. And actually, I think working on this book has really made it clear how actually that narrative doesn't really work on two kind of levels. Firstly, because, Again, like you know, going back to the examples of the women Ruth was talking about, for all the, like their lives were constrained, they actually were exercising significant. No, no, the, they, were, they were taking the freedoms they had and really pushing them to the full. Um, and, and I think other there's other examples as well in the book in the earlier part of the 20th century who were carving out a space for themselves and carving out freedoms um, for themselves. And I think to that kind of sort of like you know that to have this unproblematic progress narrative kind of underplays that and also then perhaps overestimates you know how much better things get later on um because in you know in actual fact i mean certainly looking at the kind of the lgbtq um story you're actually seeing a lot more kind of variation you have periods of sort of advancement and then periods of backlash um so for example in like 1970s and then in the 1980s and i think there's a similar story in quite a lot for quite a lot of the groups we look at so um yeah so i think it's sort of that that's something that i've found is been really important coming mm -hmm. out of this book yeah it's just not a sort of fight for rights and it's all over is it and nor is it quite so sort of us and them as that sort of phrase implies which is sort of quite interesting it's not quite yeah that, that idea of progress we definitely found that I, I think I found that as well when I was when I was uh, uncovering all of my my research on disability that this this you do have this kind of wiggish narrative in your head that kind of as as you know the state takes over more things and with the best intentions everybody does the best you know with the best intentions hospitals are set up it's all going to be great and actually 
the reality is such a kind of complex, messy story of people, for example, being taken away from their families, um, children being told, um, you know, they can't see their parents and parents being told it's best for the child that you get sent to a hospital where you can have specialist care, which actually in reality meant there wasn't very much they could do. So they kind of just locked children away and then said, um, no, that's fine. You, you go off and have some other children. And, and that's that's mm. our, our solution. Because I think when society sets itself up um, with these kind of institutions, they then become very rigid and they don't know what to do when they can't fix the problem. And so therefore, um, you get people left and abandoned and removed from their society. And so in the 1950s, 1960s, these were not great times to be a disabled person. They were not great times um, to be uh, mentally ill. They, these, were, these were times where even though to all intents and purposes, the state was actually intervening more and helping, you were being medicalized, but also sort of shunted slightly to one side and, and uh, removed from society a bit. Mm. Sorry, Claire, I've, I've dipped in there because no, um, no, no, it's, it's really it mirrored so much what yeah. you were saying there about this idea of um, thinking about progress and thinking about whether or not we are making progress. I think mm. even with that health unit of, in the GCSE, we often teach it as a kind of a bit of a wiggish narrative. Hurrah, the NHS, here it comes. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, the NHS does brilliant things for some people, but again, it's those kind of diverse stories. And we've got some brilliant stories in the book of, of children told that you know their parents have died or that they're, they're not able to see their parents mm -hmm. so that they don't ask for them anymore. Um, and that kind of you know really traumatic stuff happening, mm -hmm. uh, which we all know about. Mm, it's horrible. Susanna, are you going to try and um, chip in on, on here as well? Let's see if it's um, see see if we can get your uh, bandwidth uh, working okay. If not, we'll uh, we'll ask you to type some stuff into chat. But Susanna, try and have some stuff in on there, and we'll see if we can hear you. Lovely, thank you. Let's let's hope. <laughs> Um, so I think for me, what, what was quite interesting about working on this book was that one of the frustrations of trying to teach more diverse histories is that often you think that there's a real sort of lack of sources, but actually in researching it, it's quite interesting, just the richness of sources that we have. And I'm, I've got in front of me here a really lovely letter that I know particularly Claire looked at, which is why is it hard to find some people in historical sources? And this beautiful note uh, between uh, two men um, as well just talking about how they one of them had hoped to meet the other one in the club and so on and you can read so much about 20th century history from this so much about um, queer history so much about even just social things in terms of look they're writing a letter to each other it's quite interesting. Um, there's a whole note at the end which says please destroy this and there's so much richness that actually you can pull out of one or two fragments um, like this and again throughout the textbook we've got so many wonderful pictures that you can really use for students so um, you know for example we have a picture of um, sort of traveller people who are from the, mar who are the marshes have been made homeless by floods but richness of this of let's talk about their experiences look at their facial expressions and there's that you can pull out of this there are gaps um, in the record uh, as well. And I suppose um, the other thing they, as, as, uh, for me, my particular sort of excitement was about women's history. And just, I think that we have women's history well with looking at the diversity, because obviously women were in so many different groups within this. You can really complicate the narrative that it's all about women's liberation and feminist movement, when actually there are so many different experiences. Yeah, we haven't used the word, have we, in the book, intersectionality for really you know, obvious reasons, but, but actually there's, that's exactly what's going on in, across the whole of, our, of, of, of what we've written, is the idea that, that people are more than, more than one thing and belong to more than one sort of compartment. But what did you say? find at home when, when you were looking? What was, you know, because you've done a lot of the editing and reading the whole book together as well, so, um, you know, what was your, what was your big takeaway really from my big take was when we're teaching this stuff and it's, sort of, it's like like when we often learn things you think gosh that's so obvious but I've really just thought about it in a new way when I taught things post sort of about about the post-war welfare state I think I'd always focused on the um the laws that were enacted and um 
and then what they what they were and perhaps then some statistical data but actually as important i've learned was that was the culture that it was dropping into and this sense of um britain had emerged from the war um things were going to be better for people but there was a sort of there was a contract if you like so people were expected to be um a certain way so you get this as, as claire was referring to actually this decline of freedoms really for people who are perhaps deviant from what's expected as the norm to use that's the language or some way different or some way living um peculiar lives or as the wonderful historian that's helped us a lot becky um taylor always talks about she says i'm a historian of unpopular people people who for whatever reason weren't fitting in things got harder because that that post-war culture um the culture that created that that you know in so many ways wonderful post-war welfare state was actually really quite controlling as well and and it's been really interesting to see how that landed actually in reality in different lives so for example in one part of the book there's a real explanation of just how you know, for example if you were a gypsy roman traveler there was a halfway stage before you were allowed to even um uh, think about a council house so there was this massive pressure on gypsy roman traveler people to settle down and you know stop this traveling business because we don't have to do that anymore but you were put in a sort of almost transit situation before you were allowed a house to prove that you could live in a house. And then, uh, for example, in Scotland, there was an area of Scotland where the questions that were asked before benefits were given to people of the Gypsy Roman Traveller community were more rigorous, more <coughs> searching, more generally suspicious than for everybody else. Um, yeah, quite extraordinary. I never quite imagined that like, you sort of know it, but you don't know it till you read it. Um, so that's been really quite a revolution, a revelation, a revolution, a revelation. Um, but perhaps a bit of, I mean, maybe move on to some of that, how you, you're, you're the teachers, you people, you're the people still in the classroom, how you would actually use this book in um, class. Um, I don't know if you've got ideas about how you're going to use some of these stories. Yeah, we'll have a bit more of that. Um, so we, we had conversations about when we were starting to design the book about how we would use it. And I did, you know, make the point um, which we all, I think, knew that it was no good writing an abstract book that was going to not be able to be used in the classroom because people got so little curriculum time. Um, one of the ways that you could use this book was to use it to enrich your teaching of topics that you already teach. So we know that the civil rights uh, movement in America is very much taught still in most um, history classrooms across the land. So most of you at some point will do Martin Luther King or Rosa Parks or something like that along those lines. So, for example, using the textbook, you could take stories of other groups that are using the same language that are being influenced by um, Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King and their civil rights disobedience, the language they're using, everything they're doing, in the same way the Bristol bus boycott is picking up that kind of, and mirroring that language, We've got people like um, disability activist Paul Hunt. He's a fantastic character and I had never heard of him before I, I started researching for this book. Um, at 16, uh, he is told he's in a wheelchair. He's at 16, he's told he is going to go into the, um, the next stage of his kind of uh, disability home and that it's going to be a home really with just old men in it. So that at 16, he's been moved into that um, situation. He objects to that and he manages to find a, a new um, type of progressive home, which is a little bit better, uh, called Le Court. And he goes there, he manages to go there. But again, the management changes and they start to do things. This is again, this is institutions taking over and sort of removing people's rights and starts to say, well, actually we've got staffing issues. Everybody has to get changed into their bed clothes um, at six o'clock in the evening. You know, that, that night clothes, six o'clock in the evening, you need to be in your pajamas. And we're talking, you know, an 18, 19 year old boy who's been put in his pajamas at, at uh, you know, six o'clock at night. So he organizes a, a day of civil rights where they all protest and they don't, they, they decide that they, none of them refuse to get into their night clothes at this time. And you can see a very, you know, simple mirroring here of people that we don't, perhaps groups we don't normally think about. And here they, um, they, they do protest, they do manage to get the, um, the rights changed and they insist that they are part of the, the committees and eventually um, Paul Hunt goes on to become um, part of where well, he sets up 
U, uh, UPIAS, the Union of Physically Impaired Against Segregation. Um, and they go on to write a manifesto. And a lot of Paul Hunt's work has gone into the way now that we accept that cities are constructed, the way that um, people assume that there needs to be provision made for disabled people to make things accessible, which had not been a given before, but that is all language, um, which is coming from the civil rights movement. And it's interesting how we're seeing people sort of uh, picking up those ideas and the idea of um, being, he, he uses the, the, the term segregation, that they are being segregated from the rest of society. Now, where are we hearing that term before? And you can see how ideas are infectious, how things are moving from one uh, topic to another. We could also use, for example, um, the fantastic character, again, who um, had a new research term, and I've not heard of her before, but Lil Baloka, who is a fisherwoman from Hull. And she is outraged and basically has had enough of trawlers going out with insufficient, uh, they don't have radios, they don't have proper health and safety, and there's a kind of casualness about the idea that fishermen will just die at sea. And she has enough of this. And she literally says, I've had enough of this. You know, I think, you know, it really is right, that's it. Um, when in 1968, 58 men are drowned when three ships sink during that year. So um, in Hull, you know, this is having a really big impact. She organizes 10,000 petitions. Um, this is a working class woman from Hull who insists that on a meeting with Harold Wilson, she managed to get laws changed with some personal cost to herself as well, where she doesn't, she's not able to work again for um, two years after that, not able to get a job. And then she has to get kind of menial work. The fishing industry will not take, have a bar of her, will have nothing to do with her because it's cost them money uh, to have to upgrade all their boats and everything. But she is someone who is, again, using the idea of peaceful protest, but very insistent on the idea of rights of people and of, of civil disobedience. They call themselves the headscarf revolutionaries. And um, she is a story I feel like we should be teaching rather than this idea that sort of women in the 1960s were this kind of passive, um, quiet bunch. Mm. What about you, Claire? What's, uh, how would you use it? Yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously, like, you know, using some of those individual stories and kind of weaving them into what you're already teaching, you know, is can be, you know, is really, really powerful. Um, and I mean, just picking up what, what Ruth was saying there, like, you know, about the infectious nature of civil rights ideas. There's um one bit uh, where I'm talking, um, where one of the inquiries about sort of like how decriminalisate, partial decriminalisation of male homosexuality isn't the end of the story. And I kind of open it for a quote from um, a magazine that was written for, um, well, it was written for lesbians and other queer women, um, sort of saying, they're going great guns in the United States. This is post Stonewall. We need to copy them. We need to sort of see what they, you know, uh, do similar. Uh, and so, you know, that's really interesting if you're teaching kind of like, you know, civil rights movements to sort of show international connections and, and how they're sort of and how they're working together. Um, yeah. But I mean, so I suppose the other thing as well is to talk about some of the inquiries. Um, so, um, I mean, I'll, I'll give an example um, of one of the inquiries. So I'll stay with that one I was just talking about. Um, so one of the inquiries um, that I've put uh, put together to look at sort of queer history in the sort of 1970s is um, how is decriminalis decriminalization not the end of the story for LGBTQ plus people? And um, this might be a kind of a, a nice um, inquiry to look at in the context of not just obviously looking at this uh, one bit of legislation. So in 1967, the partial decriminalisation of male homosexuality, homosexuality in um, England and Wales, not Scotland and Northern Ireland. It has, I hasten to add. Um, uh, and sort of looking at how the impact of that, um, or rather the impact of its limitations, um, because uh, it's, I uh, know, we had the centenary, um, not centenary, bicentenary, um, um, a while ago and there was quite a lot of sort of publicity about it and how sort of seismic it was but actually looking at some of the documents what's often being picked up by activists is its limitations um, how far the law doesn't affect people's lives and and as a result you start seeing uh, the development of um, for example the gay liberation front uh, and other sort of activist movements um, and 
you see this real upsurge in really these really kind of vibrant um, sort of uh, uh, civil rights movements where they're not just adopting new tactics. So they're doing stuff like um, disrupting um, Cliff Richards gathering in London uh, by sort of, in, you know, uh, get, sneaking in and kind of like, you know, releasing mice into the crowd and dropping banners. It's all quite, uh, it, it, it's all quite dramatic. Um, but so these kind of real, really theatrical tactics, um, but also, um, uh, kind of like you know, these new ideas about how well the law in itself isn't going to help us it's social attitudes that are the problem and we need to kind of be more open about our identities this kind of notion of being out and visible is developed and that's where you kind of get the first sort of pride parades um, occurring so now obviously a fascinating story in itself um, but also what it kind of, the, the sort of themes and big questions you can kind of pick up out of it, um, I think are really interesting as well. So in terms of kind of like, how much do changes in the law actually affect people's lives? Um, and sometimes, you know, is it, you know, it's actually disappointment with the limitations of law rather uh, that can generate activism rather than a desire to change the law in itself there um and the importance of not just like what the you know what the legal situation is but also wider social attitudes for the position of different groups in society which i think are really interesting ideas uh, that can be sort of like picked up and explored and discussed there so that's um that's one of the inquiries um the other one um that I've sort of put together for the second part of the book and actually I want to go back here to um, uh, Mark's earlier question um, about the uh, wives um, of people during the miners strike so uh, one of the uh, one of my briefs was to kind of put an inquiry together about the 1980s which obviously is a period of um, certainly for the LGBTQ community is a period of like you know reaction essentially um, so things some things have advanced some haven't uh, in the 1970s and then you're sort of seeing some real challenges come through. But I think what I, what I, the, the inquiry question that I put together there was how did the struggle for LGBTQ um, plus rights get fiercer in the 1980s and 1990s? And I think what I was trying to do there was to really foreground the act, com, um, how communities formed, how they supported each other, uh, and how they kind of worked together to try and overcome these challenges. So there's I set the inquiry sort of set up by looking at the situation in the 1980s, looking at kind of the thing, the foundation, of the 70s um, and the activism that's developed there has kind of laid where you've got a increasingly uh, some level of increasing self-confidence amongst the community. You've got organisations that have already been established. You've also got relationships being formed between some of these groups and local government in particular. Um, and then it takes three sort of key kind of moments of challenge. Um, so one is the minor strike and um, how I um, approach that is we look at um, the activities of lesbians and gays support the minors um, as commemorated in the fabulous film Pride. Um, and now I, I sort of told that story both through the, um, one of the key organizing members of LGSM, uh, Mark Ashton, uh, but also through Cyan James, Cyan James um, one of the kind of, uh, women who was involved in the mining communities there um, and, and sort of told a sort of parallel story with that. Um, and then also um, looked at another individual story, uh, indiv individual and group stories connected to um, the AIDS crisis, um, looking particularly at the life of a guy called Mark Thompson, uh, who was a survivor and a community organiser um, in that period. Um, and uh, then also looking at Section 28. Um, and I think you know, in terms of what I was trying to achieve there was to tell a story of what, which is, you know, in some cases reasonably quite, quite well, pretty bleak. Uh, let's be honest, it, you know, there's some really kind of challenging and, and, and horrible things happening. But to sort of ensure that I was telling it in a way that sort of allowed agency to the people involved and, and showed how uh, groups responded to challenges there as well. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, you know, if you're talking about sort of like civil rights movements, um, it's, I think often that some, sometimes, and this I'm talking about my own teaching in the past, there's been a sort of tendency to be like, here are the things that the government or wider society is doing, here's sort of the reaction, and to perhaps pay less attention than you might 
about sort of how the group organizes about solidarity within the group ra um, rather than kind of conflict and um, it's just a slightly different way of looking at it really uh, mm. thank you um Susanna's internet is, is really struggling, so I'll also just elaborate a little bit on, on how you might use some of the, the making history um, sections in the uh, classroom. Um, and I think we're always trying to find ways, aren't we, to enable students to see that there's a, there's a discipline, there's, there's evidence, there's construction behind what's, what's going on. And um, um, for example, um, we've got a section that talks about why can historians find few sources about some people and it's as a spread so you could you could simply use it in one lesson if you between sequences they do do bridging um and professor becky taylor talks about uh, when well, she answers certain questions i'll just share with you the questions that she answers why do we have lots of sources about wealthy and powerful people why do we have fewer sources of evidence about poorer and less powerful people? Why are some people not named in any sources from the past? Why did wealthy and powerful people ignore some people? And are there any sources of evidence about these people? And does that mean historians need to think differently? Um, and with working with Becky, we, we, we teased out those questions and then she has answered those in, in bullet points. And then what we've done is key up some, tee up some questions. So the questions for students to either think about or discuss or to take further are, which group of people does Becky say often leave fewer sources about their lives? So obviously that's a, that's a more direct comprehension. But then getting them to think which other groups of people might have left fewer sources for historians to find to see if they can start to um, apply what they've learned and to, to infer. And then if you want to take it this far, what source of sources of evidence of past people can you find in your local environment? Because in fact, in this, um, Becky ends up finishing up by saying, you know, we, well, in response to the, are there any sources of evidence about these people? She says, um, she's talked about Gypsy Roma Traveller people in this case. And she says, yes, we can find different kinds of sources of evidence. For example, the words of a folk song might take, tell the story of one person falling in love with another. The people may not be named, but the song reveals experiences of life and love, and it can give us clues about the experiences of people who were like them. So it's really looking at what you do when you've got the fragmentary. But she also says we can use the local environment as a source of evidence. For example, in the name Gypsy Lane in a town or village, which is not necessarily uncommon. So, Inviting the students or yourselves to take the students into, into thinking about the clues in the historic environment. Um, and with Vicky um, um, Ignarski Broad, I always much fudge her name, bless her, because um, I'm absolutely <laughs> hopeless at presenting Polish origin today, that's really bad. Um, but we, we, we dealt with the issue, how do items from the past find their way into archives? Because we thought that was something that we, we rarely had chance to, to address. And she works for the National Archives and she's been really um, open and explicit, but very clear about what items are in the archives and, and, and how they get there and why she thinks it's important for students to, to understand how archives work. And then what she's talked about in these just two just spread of the textbook um, enables students to explore a type of protest and then Think, of any, think about the sorts of records the National Archives will have, and then think about the sorts of questions that historians could ask of those sources in the archives. So we, we hope we're really making very, very clear and explicit the, um, the disciplinary processes that, um, that go on behind some of these. Um, and Susanna's kindly typed up some, some more into chat. I mean, she's terribly apologetic that the uh, that the internet has has gone down and, and, and thanks for being hot on the keyboard Susanna. Yeah, um, yeah. sorry just going to jump oh, in. Go on, uh, yeah no yeah. I think I mean also like you know, one of, I think that's one of the things that I'm particularly pleased with about the book is, is um obviously we've got plenty of historians um who are appearing in the book and who and we're sort of seeing uh, and, and sort of explaining their processes but I'm I'm really pleased that we've also kind of like expanded 
a little bit the sense of what the discipline is and who's involved in constructing history. Like, as you said, with Vicky's um, sort of spread there. Uh, and, th and later on, there's a spread where we're kind of comparing the National Archives um, and um, another archive, the Hall Carpenter Archive. Uh, and just, you know, opening up the question of sort of how different archives collect different materials, why some archives are kind of well, sort of like well established, uh, and also, but how some other archives are more sort of like, you know, um, well, in the case of the Hall Carpenter archive, it's kept in someone's flat for a bit, then it's almost kind of broken up um, later on. So it's sort of, again, if you want to really explore questions of evidence, um, and how historians use it, but also what evidence is, is available to historians to use, how, like, you know, questions about silences in the archives. I think, you know, this could be really, really useful. I think fundamentally, we just think it's, you know, more pluralistic and more democratic, and it's just more more history and better history, which I think we're, we're all after, aren't we? And as, as Claire referred to earlier in, in, the, in the sort of discussion. Um, we've also looked at how historians describe things and um, I'm very aware that it's a you know it's a warm evening in June and we're all incredibly busy so we'll also sort of wrap up very shortly but did just want to make that offer again but and, and feel free if you want to hang back on this one we'll hang back if anybody wants to ask any questions particularly about some of the sensitivities about description and language we could we could spend a little bit of time um, you know five or ten minutes now if anybody wants to exploring that or to put a question. Um, you know, for, you know, for example, what do we mean, as I said earlier, by gypsy <coughs> Roman? Um, how should we refer to people in the past who fall within the remit of queer history, if I can put it as, as broadly as that? Um, we've been chewing on this an awful lot. We couldn't claim necessarily to be the experts, but we're very willing and, and, and happy and, and would like to, if, if, if it's useful to you, share and help and support. But we're also, you can you can find us on Twitter, you can connect to us again via Hodder Education, or as I say, if you want to uh, hang back and ask the specific question, because I know sometimes people are a bit sensitive, obviously, about asking in a recorded session um, when you don't necessarily know who's who's listening, but so if you want to do that, then I'm, I'm sure that would be possible. I'm saying that on behalf of Potter Education, <laughs> and I think um, uh, if there, I can't see any further sort of direct questions to everybody in the chat, so we'll say a a massive thank you for for turning out on a June night to hear us um, whiffle on about something we've been enjoyed putting together. But as I say, we've, we've really got quite passionate. I think about the sort of we need to find ways of telling these stories in the class because this is about people mm -hmm. yep. in all their holy gloriness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so thank you and um, take care and we hope uh, you will enjoy using these materials. Good night. Thanks everyone. Good night.